What is up, guys? It is the Blue Bloods here, back with another team preview for the 2022 season. And we got a team who opens up their season this upcoming weekend in Montgomery against Jacksonville State. Stephen F. Austin, and I couldn't think of a better guest than my guy Dustin Helton coming on to talk to talk his team, host of host of a great podcast on the, on the WAC and A Sun Man. Go check that out as well on YouTube and all podcast networks. But Dustin, man, appreciate you joining the show. Let people know where they can find you find the show and everything like that hey, yeah thanks for having me so uh i have a a, a podcast with a couple of asun guys will seiler and uh Randon owens called wax sun weekly you can find us as part of the fcs fans nation uh youtube channel so go subscribe and you can get i mean a plethora of podcasts all across fcs but we've got the whack and asun covered for you guys Hey, man, it, great podcasting, also great podcast network um, as well. You know, we're going to have more guests from that network as we do some more of these team previews, guys, so stay tuned. But the question before we get into this season has been the offseason, really the past two season question marks surrounding the, the you know, WAC and the A-Sun. Conference realignment has been insane for the FCS. We've seen some teams move back to the Southland from the WAC, what do you see Stephen F. Austin's future being in terms of FCS conference realignment as we enter into 2022? Man, I, I don't know. Like, it, if you ask the fans, they're torn. Half of them want to go FBS to keep up with, you know, keep up with Sam Houston, and half of them want to stay in FCS because it's where we are. Um, you know, I've always liked the WAC. I, I, I think the WAC could be a very viable conference if you give it a couple of years. Once you get, uh, you know, teams like. Utah Tech moved up and Tarleton moved up, although Tarleton's going to go FBS because they're getting the Texas A&M money to do it. So it, it it does kind of put the whack kind of on shaky ground right now. Um, I my hope my because my hope is once you see the the new schism happen with uh with the P5 schools just completely separate from the G5 that conference USA turns around and looks at SFA and says, hey, we need to bring you up with Sam Houston. We need a we need another Texas team uh, in there. Um, but you know, uh, who knows, uh, right now playing with the WAC, uh, a sun challenge, I mean, or the AQ 10 as we're calling this year is great. I hope they do it again next year. I hope we get some more cross pollination on schedules versus what we had this year. Um, obviously this year scheduling was thrown off because of Lamar leaving or leaving and, and, and Cardinal were backing out. You know, we had planned to play a WAC schedule. A sun had planned to play an a sun schedule. Um, and then last minute, this partnership came back together, but I think for the next year or two, you'll see it stick around as, as a true challenge. And then who knows, maybe it becomes a bigger FCS conference, but I think the ASUN has a better ability of getting teams into their conference versus the WAC. They have a lot more FCS ready teams in their footprint versus what the WAC has. And so that's, that puts the WAC at a bit of a disadvantage. Yeah. I think you see that like if you're in the Southeast, I mean, the amount of teams that you can pick from, from even the top D2 teams are really located in that Southeast region. So I think, like you said, the ASUN and some and some of those conferences really have their their choosing of who they want to bring up and who they want to move where and things like that. But Stephen F. Austin is, I mean, the preseason hype is unreal around this program right now. I mean, I had them, I believe, number seven or eight in my top twenty-five. I believe they came out top ten as well for the FCS stats. As a as someone who's been following this program for a long time, what have been the main keys for you that you've seen under head coach Col uh, Colby Carthel in terms of this rebuild for Stephen F. Austin? Yeah, I think actually it starts above him. It starts with the our AD Ryan Ivy. He came in and and completely caused a paradigm shift. You know, we had years where we were hyped up. Uh, you know, twenty or two thousand nine, two thousand ten. You know, we were hyped up. Uh, some of this when we had Jeremy Moses. Uh, twenty fourteen when Clint Collin came in and coached, we got hyped up a bit too because it's the first year. But we haven't seen it like it's been. Carthel came in and took a program that was just at the bottom there was nothing there and he might be some people say he's a year ahead of where he should be and I, to me that's a good thing because you know we went three and nine six and four eight and four last year you know it does as a fan is weird for for me to see this hype <laughs> on our team right because you know it almost makes me a little nervous because i'm like are, are, are we gonna live up to this when you have folks like sam herter saying hey these guys are you know these guys are, are going to be a, a team that goes deep. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, let's not, you know, get too ahead of ourselves here. Let's play the games first. <laughs> but no, I mean, it's, it's been a huge paradigm shift. Kobe Carthel is a fun guy. He, I think sometimes folks take him too seriously and people don't appreciate the jokes with him and everything else. Um, 
but he's a smart guy. He won it and in commerce. He, he knows how to win. It runs in his family with his dad coaching as well. And, you know, uh, maybe, you know, this is the year we have a deep playoff run. Maybe this year we make it to Frisco. Who knows? Um, but we, this is, I think this is one of the best teams we've had on paper ever. And so I'm really excited to see how the games play out. Yeah, I don't know if it makes you even uneasy. I came on the show and said that I, I think this team has the talent to be a semifinal team. Yeah, I, I really do. And I think anything less than a quarterfinals to me would be shocking. And I know a lot of people are, you know, a, a lot of FCS fans are always skeptical of newer teams who are experiencing success for the first time in a while. If they don't have that long history of playoff success, you see some of the talking heads in the FCS be like, we, they got to win in the playoffs first. We can't. Put them. We can't have those projections until they do it. You know, for you looking at the, looking at this season, what is the under Carthel? What is the next step for you? Like, as long as you guys achieve this, you're gonna be as a fan base. You guys are gonna be okay. We're in this. We're, we're taking a step in the right direction. Yeah. One, we got to beat Sam Houston about Honey Woods. It's the last one. We got to send them packing it with with a win. That's just that's that's number one. Number two, I would love to see us beat. Uh, uh, Jacksonville State and and Tech, if not, get two out of three in those games because I think it's, you know, I, we're going to get some, I, people are going <clears> to <throat> give us some, uh, you know, slam us because we're having to play Abilene Christian twice now. We're playing Warner University, who's I've never even heard of uh, until this year. And that's because of the whole Lamar Incarnate Word leaving and we couldn't back fill our schedule. So once we get past our non conference games, our, our conference games are not that tough. I, I think the toughest game we have not, or it would, after you know conference starts it's technically a non-conference it's technically central arkansas you know um and i think that's i think that's gonna hurt so i think we can come out strong beat jacksonville state beat louisiana tech beat sam houston and battle piney woods um and then once we get to the playoffs just get a playoff win we haven't won a playoff game in 13 14 years you know that's what we need i, I think that's or we got to erase the stigma of not being able to win in the playoffs. You know, losing last year in overtime to Incarnate Word, as great of a team that Incarnate Word had, that stung so bad to, to lose that way. Um, so for me, you know, those when those big games early, get a playoff win. If we make the quarterfinals, that'd be awesome. If we make the semifinals, that'd be great. And if we make Frisco, well, I'll go nuts. But if we can at least just get a playoff win, I think that solidifies what Carthel has done. I think that also helps some of the skeptics who say, hey, he's a year early. Hey, he's doing this. Hey, they're not worth the hype. Um, I think that will help erase those doubts. And one of the guys that a, a lot of people are, are talking about on Stephen F. Austin is Xavier Gibson. I've, I've said on my show, he's the best wide receiver undisputed in FCS right now, just due to production talent. What makes him such a special player? And how early did how early did it click in your mind that he was going to be what he's turned out to be thus far for Stephen F. Austin? I think for him, it's really the fact that he has Trey Self throwing him the ball. I think that's been a huge step up having a quarterback who can who can launch it, who makes smart plays, and, and Self is very smart. But Gibson has such great speed, such great hands. I mean, I believe he is the leading current active FCS uh, receiving yards leader. You know. He's going to be playing on Sundays. He has that, just that skill. And I mean, there are some games last year was insane. I mean, one game he had 138 yards and three touchdowns on four catches against Eastern Kentucky, like just insane. His talent is insane. And it's going to be, I honestly didn't think he was going to stick around this year. I figured somebody would pick him up in a transfer portal or say, Hey, come here where we have, you know, some, some good NIL or something. But the fact that he stayed, I think shows his character too, that he wants to stay and play with Trey Self and, and went under coach Carthel. So it's going to be, you know, once he leaves, of course, it's going to be, it's going to be disappointing because to lose such a great player, but maybe it sets the tone for us to get more wide receivers, you know, to become more of a wide receiver uh, uh, target uh, for them. So, but I mean, I love the guy. He's such a great guy and it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun just to watch him. Just great talent, great pure athleticism. And I mean, I think the the special teams too makes him so special as well. The fact that he could be such because he was a first team All Conference selection at both the return specialist and wide receiver. I mean, it, it, he's a special talent. I think even that Mississippi Valley State game, he had three catches for two touchdowns and didn't even play in like the second half. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just it's just insane what he does. Man, he's so versatile and where you can put him and what he can do. In my opinion, I think this year is a really big year for him, especially if Stephen F. Austin makes a deep playoff run, because I think the film against some of those top FCS teams in the playoffs could be huge in terms of what it could do for his draft stock. 
moving forward out of Stephen F. Austin. And outside of Xavier Gibson, you mentioned you mentioned stuff at the quarterback spot. Who are some players that people might not be talking about right now that you think could have big years for Stephen F. Austin in 2022? Well, the nice thing, too, with these players is that we didn't lose a lot last year. And, you know, last year we were 12th in FCS scoring offense and 17th in defense. And with that, I mean, we brought back, um, we got, you know, Miles Hurd, we've got Trey Self. And then on the defense side, we got Brevin Randall. We got BJ Thompson, who's going to be playing on, on Sunday. You know, it's we just those guys are guys to watch out for. They'll be on on top of it. Um, you know, we talked about Gibson. We talked about uh, Trey Self. Um, and then we've got Miles Reed. Uh, and Miles Reed, was, you know, he only had three touchdowns last year, but he still almost had 700 yards on the ground. Like he was very, uh, very productive in helping open up the passing game and helping, you know, Gibson be able to get some of those deep balls that he got. So. I think you see Miles Reed have a more productive year, but watch our defense. I think our defense will end up being top 10 this year. Um, granted, you know, uh, some people say because you're playing rescheduled, but I still think they just, they, you know, they, they were so good last year and they're all coming back. So I, I would keep an eye more on our defensive players. Uh, one or two of them could be playing pro. The, the secondary is loaded. It, Miles Hurd for me, I think it's a guy who's extremely underrated. And then even the linebacker, the linebacking core is extremely underrated too with, with Brevin Reynolds, some of those guys. And, and you mentioned the defensive line. I think we all under, we all know that BJ is going to be playing at the next level. If there's one position group from last year that you're looking to take the biggest step forward, which position group on this Stephen F. Olsen team do you think that is? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of hard because we had really good special teams too. We had a great kicker. Uh, great punter, Max Quick. Um, you no, know, we had a great kicker. We had great special teams. I, to me, I think it's our offensive line play. I would like to see them. I mean, again, you know, uh, we, we only we talked about top pressure only having 700 yards on the ground. You know, they have to be able to protect Trey, give him time to throw, give him, you know, give him time to move. That's it, though. Like, compared to last year, everybody played so far above what you thought they were going to do. I think it's just making sure that we close out the games that we need to win. Last year, our three regular season games, we lost them by a combined total of 11 points. You know, last minute loss to Jacksonville State, last minute loss to uh, Sam Houston, and then the Texas Tech game that we should have won had we gotten, you know, uh, our, the pass interference call that the, that the Big 12 refs apologized for on Monday. So I, I think to that, you know, the team is so where they need to be. It's not necessarily a group getting better. It's just making sure they close out the games. That's that's it. The close, especially the big games that, that they need to win. You know, how much would in uh, this year, in, in terms of quarterback play for Trey Self, what do you want to see from him? He had a huge year last year, has gotten all-conference, all-American consideration. What's the next step for Trey Self at the quarterback spot for you to lead this offense to potentially even I, – I think this offense has the talent to be a top-10 offense easily, top possibly top five, everything goes right. But what do you need to see from Trey Self in, in another year in this offense? I, I think it's just the little intangibles, right? Making sure he's always making the correct passes. Sometimes he does make – you look at a couple passes, you're like, why'd you throw that ball? Obviously, you know, there's things that drive in. Of course, you know, I'm not a quarterback. And when I played, I didn't play quarterback. So, I'm, you know, I'm not and <laughs> where he is. So I think it's the little things. That's that's just going to round him out. I mean, stats-wise, top-notch. I mean, he's he's what uh, – I mean, a lot of teams, he's second team, third team, All-American, right? I think Hero Sports is third team. Whack, he was, I think, second team All-American. So – it's just it's just those little intangibles that he needs because he's got the arms, he's got the wheels, he's he's you know he's got the ability. It's just making sure that he makes the right decisions just all the time. Yeah, I agree. I, I think I think this year is primed to be a big year for Trey Self, especially if the offensive line could take that step forward. Like you said, if you, I think getting him a little bit more comfortable in the pocket, you could really see that next big step for Trey Self. And you mentioned the conference schedule is a bit iffy, but. There's some big out of conference games this year for Stephen F. Austin. Looking at the schedule, which games are the toughest in your opinion coming into 2022? Um, so I mean, so I mean, week one, uh, week zero, I guess Jacksonville State. That's a that's an interesting one. I think it's kind of hard to scout because you got Rich Rodriguez going in and coaching, right? They don't. I don't think they figured out their quarterback situation. So you don't know what to prep for. You know what happened last year you, when SFA played Jacksonville State. SFA dominated every stat on the page but still lost because turnovers at the beginning of the game and then they lost in the last second. They didn't close it out. So to me, it's Jacksonville State. Um, Louisiana Tech is an interesting one because Louisiana, Louisiana Tech hired like half of the SFA coaching staff last year. Um, and, you know, they're – and Rustin's not that far from Nacogdoches. It's, uh, you know – um, I think that would be a, a, a great test. And then you got Sam Houston, but even past the Sam Houston, Valpine Woods and how important that game is. And I'm not downplaying that 
when you get to the end of the year, it's going to be the SFA UCA is the last, I think the last top game on the schedule. The rest of the whack is just not that good. And it's not necessarily your fault. It's just Abilene Christian's got a first year coach, Tarleton, you know, Tarleton lost their starting quarterback. They got transfer in, but they're still not there. Utah tech and Southern Utah, you know, Southern Utah is just bad. Utah tech is coming in, you know, so it, it's the other game. So SFA versus UCA is going to be really interesting because UCA is going to be fighting for that playoff spot. I think it's going to be between them and Eastern Kentucky to get the last spot out of the, the wax sun, sorry, wax sun, you know, partnership, if you will. So, so that UCA game on November 12th is going to be, I think, one of the most important games on the schedule. I don't think anybody should sleep on that. Thankfully, it's in Nacogdoches instead of on the Stripes and Conway because those Stripes are hideous. Sorry, Will, my podcast partner, he's a UCA guy. He loves them. They're, they're the ugliest thing, ugliest turf I've ever seen. But um, that I think so Jacksonville State, Louisiana Tech, uh, Battle Piney Woods, UCA. Those are the four games that are going to matter. Those are going to be the make or break games for SFA this year. Yeah, I mean, I'll throw one in there because, I mean, I'd – uh, week one, uh, I'll be in Lorman for that Stephen F. Olsen Alcorn State game. I'll be I'll be going to that one. That's that that's the game I picked to go cover, and I, I think that game is a real interesting one, especially when you look at the success that Alcorn State's had recently. They had kind of a down year last year with some injuries and things that happened, but get a big quarterback from Louisiana Tech coming in to take over for Felix Harper, and we know what Steve Mc, I mean, uh, not Steve, um, Fred McNair's been able to do in terms of coaching that team up, especially in big games. So I think that could be one that could be interesting. K.J. Kinsler is a really, really great safety, and they got some great defensive backs over at Alcorn State. I think that's a game that is going to be interesting depending on how the Jacksonville State game goes for Stephen F. Austin because, I mean, they say it's a neutral site, but let's be honest, the game's in Montgomery. That's not really a neutral site per se for them. And, you know, it's a real interesting dynamic when you have to play a team who's transitioning too. They have so many – like, they they get those extra scholarships. Even though they're not really eligible for anything big, it's still something that Stephen F. Austin has to overcome. So if you win that game, you don't get credit for an FBS win even though – you technically are playing an FBS school and, and you, and you guys get two of those and Stephen F Austin and Jacksonville state. So I think those games are big. And I think getting central Arkansas late in the season is going to be interesting. I think, um, I, I think central Arkansas looking at the loss of Tyler Hudson at wide receiver, looking at um, the quarterback, leaving the other wide receiver, I'm, I'm blanking Lawans headed oh, out as well. Yep. Yeah. And so, Early in the season, I think that team is going to be vulnerable just because they're so young and so many key places and they lost some of their top contributors. But later in the season, if that team starts to click, like you said, that that could be a terrifying team. Yeah, well, they got up against. Yeah, they got Will, what's his name? Will McAvane from uh from yep. you and I who's transferring and they then they bring back Darius Hale, who honestly yep. should have won the should have won the freshman Jerry Rice Award. He should have won that award. Like He's great. So and, and and Coach Brown is a great coach. He can take any anybody and make them a talented player because of what he does. So so that I mean, I think as like you said, as we get there, that's always going to be Alcorn State almost I don't want to ever say a team is a trap game because I feel like that's an insult to the team, but that is almost a trap game. And Alcorn State is is good. I they're not to the top of the swack yet. You know, they're like they're just I think a couple year or two off, but but they're really good and we shouldn't sleep on them just because it's Alcorn State. Like, yeah, I mean, they, like all the things you said, they are really solid. I'm actually kind of looking forward to that one too, even though I won't be there for it. Yeah, uh, they have a really good, I think if I'm not mistaken, they got one of the highest home win percentages in the SWAC too. It's hard to go to Lorman and play in that and play it. They call it the reservation down there. It's hard to go down there and play in Lorman because I, I've heard that it's an interesting environment. So I'm excited for that one. But to get to, the overall expectations of the season what right now you know you can't you things can change depending on course injuries different things happening what is your prediction and expectations for Stephen f austin in 2022 so if we stay healthy big thing i would i think it's i i I think we could go one loss or undefeated right i it just we got to see what happens this weekend it's it's I really doubt we go. I, I call them our three FBS, FBS games, even though two of them don't count. But I, it's I think if we're able to go unscathed through those three, then that really gives us a shot to go undefeated. The only other sort of little trap I see there is because we play Abilene Christian twice, and it's not that they're good. It's just it's hard to beat a team twice in the same year, right? And so um, and so, but my expectations as a fan, I, I think we'll be up there ten wins, um, at least you know, quarterfinal to the playoffs. I, you know, if we get sent to Fargo, 
I, I don't know how we do against North Dakota State and that team. You know, if we get if we got sent to Brookings, I think we have a better match against like South Dakota State. But uh, that's that's my expectation. So we make the quarterfinals and we lose. I'm going to be happy as a fan. I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to kill me. Like, you know, and I know that's sort of a weird thing to say. Like, yes, I want to be in Frisco. I want to win in Frisco. I think we would pack the house in Frisco. But to go from where we were in 2019 versus where we at the end of this year, I mean, that in itself is just a great thing to have. So that's where I'd be. That's where I'd be happy at as a fan. You know, I, I can definitely see, I, I think, one to two losses is probably where I about have this team. I think uh, people underestimate how hard it really is to go undefeated. And I think you get a lot of that with, with fan bases. Cause we did you know we've, we've done some previews, Jackson state fans think it's undefeated. I'm like, man, it's really hard to go undefeated yeah. on, on a schedule, regardless of how easy, tough, like it is hard, especially in conference. When you get those teams who have seen you multiple times and to have, like you said, really three FBS games. You yeah. get a tough road game in Lorman. You also uh, have to host Central Arkansas late in the season. Like there, And when you look at the Southland last year, there were some big upsets in those second games. I mean, I th- if I'm not mistaken, McNeese caught Southeastern Louisiana slacking, mm-hmm. and there were a few other ones with Nichols and some other mm-hmm. teams. So I, I just I think undefeated is tough, especially for a team who um, is is just kind of catching their win. And so I think if they, you can get through the season with two losses, win the whack, get that auto bid, potentially you know be in the running for one of those uh, top eight seeds. But I, I don't know if they're going to get that because I think with the way the committee works, I think six of them are probably already locked up, barring you know catastrophic things happening to North Dakota State, South Dakota State, Sac State, some of those teams. But I think if, if if Stephen F. Austin can get that first home game hosted and then go into the second round with with a favorable matchup, I don't see why quarterfinals potentially, if everything goes right with, with matchups, a semifinal appearance. But as we both know, who you have to face and win is so important in the playoffs. And so that, that seeding would be – yeah. It will be really, really interesting. And I mean, for me, I would love to see a rematch with the Carnate Word. I think that's a game everyone. They're not. They're not going to make the playoffs. You don't think so? You don't think they even get no. an at large bid? No, they. Lo- I mean, I, they, I mean, they lost their coach. They lost what they lost. Really, what really made their team great in Cam Ward? They went with the Washington State. You know, they got a new coach coming in. If I'm looking at Southland, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, honestly, Southland's almost kind of open because Southeastern Louisiana lost Cole Kelly. You know. You know, this could be the year that Nichols comes in and says, hey, this is ours. Maybe this year that McNeese comes back and says, hey, you know, we're going to take back what's ours. I mean, I'm not downplaying Incarnate Word. I just don't think they're a, a playoff team. But the other point, too, is when we look at the WAC Ace, and we have to finish better than Kennesaw State somehow. And that's, that's tough. And that's to get that to get that auto a bit. And we don't play each other. So it's I'm interested to know how they're going to decide who gets the qualifier because there's maybe they'll use common opponents at a record this year or something like that. But you know, it's going to be us in Kennesaw State fighting for that, I think, for that auto bid. And so, we, I mean, we nine and two won't get it. I don't think nine and two would get us a seed um, because outside of the uh, the three FBS games and, I mean, Alcorn, like our schedule, because we have uh, we have a non-D1 on there and then, the you know, the, the WAC as a whole, it wouldn't help us get a seed. I think we would get the host, but I don't, I don't, nec- I mean, I'm sure we would win our bid to host, but I don't think it would be a seed sort of situation so in order to get a seed we have to we have to win out so that is what i think carthel will have up that we need to do this and yes it's one of the hardest things to do but there's a year for him to do it it's a year it's for awesome. him it's this year to do it yeah and then you know i would love incarnate word but also too it might be fun to playoffs to get kennesaw state to get that match that That's we didn't true. get this year in the uh in the wax sun um uh, that i mean that'd be a fun one to to watch it's just tough because I, I know it's like the 400 mile thing, and there's just so many teams that are probably going to be in the playoffs in between, you know, Texas and and yeah. Atlanta. That I mean, you could potentially, I mean, those Tennessee schools really throw a wrench into things just because of you know how that state is shaped. It's like, are you gonna? And then an interesting one is if if one of the if like a Missouri state or someone doesn't get to get that first round by how they play into it. So there's a lot to do. And Kennesaw, I know, has a lot of question marks. A lot of people are wondering what it's going to be like with the – they got a really difficult schedule. Yeah. Compared to what they're used to playing in the Big South. So, you know, will Kennesaw be the same team it was last year? We'll see. I love I, – listen, Xavier Shepard is, is an absolute stud. But you you mentioned the what if. And, and let's say everything goes right. Frisco is the destination for Stephen F. Austin. What what would that mean to the school, the fan base, the program, and and with that game being in Frisco, what would you expect the turnout to be for Stephen F. Austin in that game? 
I mean, so for turn uh, for home games, we average between eight and ten thousand uh, a game, right? We have a lot of alumni in Dallas, more so than in, in Houston, and so I don't think when you see Balpine Woods attendance, it really echoes the true scope of SFA. You know, I guess it depends on who we play. You know, North Dakota, North Dakota State fans are already buying the tickets as soon as they go on yeah. sale next week, right? <laughs> um, but I think you would get a, you would probably get uh, SFA fans would would buy all they could. You'd probably get maybe not a 50-50 split, but probably a 55-45, that sort of range, just because if it's NDSU. Now, if it's somebody else, like South Dakota State or Montana or, or Montana State, one of those schools, then I think you would see a larger, the you would see more SFA fans there because they would we would buy the tickets. You know, we do have a we we do have a pretty rapid fan base, uh, um, especially if whenever we've done events in the postseason, like the basketball march. When we had March Madness game in Dallas, I mean, the the game was filled with SFA fans, even though we're playing Texas Tech. You know, it was a good 50-50 split there. Um, so that that's it. You know, and I mean, if we if we talk about like a, a dream matchup, I would actually like for us to play South Dakota State. I think it'd be great to have Jackson Jacks in the uh, in Frisco. But I mean, let you know, let's get there first. And let's see who we get. More than likely, if we do get there, it's going to be someone like North Dakota State. So, um, which would be a fun one too. I think with their their Smash Mouth sort of offense that they have versus our defense, it would be it'd be probably one uh, uh, probably one of uh, just a top defensive game. But uh, you know, who knows? That's why we got to play them. Any given Saturday, anything can happen. So you never know. I think the media and the fans would really love two teams that have never won. The championship to match up that would be it be, it's been a long time since we yeah. <laughs> had a first time champion so yeah um you you know uh or a matchup with two of them but the last question here man in terms of expectations that the watch list for the walter payne buck buchanan everything comes out bj thompson on the defensive side trey self xavier gibson on the offensive side do you for do you, i guess give me your thoughts on their chances to take home the Walter Payton or Buck Buchanan award going into 2022. I think the, the the concern I have here is that I think Trey Self and Xavier Gibson would steal votes from each other, right? If they if the two of them were both finalists, they would steal votes from each other. So as much as much as I hate to say it, it needs to only be one of them. I I would love to see Xavier Gibson win it because you know it's it's a quarterback award, right? I mean you know I mean. Cooper Cup's got. I mean, it's 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 a quarter. It's a quarterback award. So I'd love to see Gibson come in as a wide receiver and win it. I think Trey Self probably has the better opportunity to do it. Um, defense, I think I I think uh, BJ would could easily get the Buck Buchanan award. Um, you know, uh, I like I said like I said, this is our best shot to win those awards. You know, we did have Walter Payton Award winner Jeremy Moses. Honestly, I think Trey Self is a better quarterback than Jeremy Moses was. So I would like to see him see him get. It. Because I mean Moses was great, but Moses was known for his meltdowns too. And we haven't, you know, Trey yeah. Self hasn't been as bad there as, as Jeremy Moses was. So, I, so, but yeah, if if we get to the finalists, it's got to be one of them. If it's both of them, I don't think either one will win because they'll steal votes from each other. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think there's a quarterback bias. We see it with the Hosman. We see it with the Walter Payton. But I think, you know, for me looking at it, I I just, in my opinion, it should go to the best player, regardless, most dominant player, whatever. I think Xavier Gibson is that. I don't think I think when you look at how how dominant he is at his position that, in my opinion, he should be the favorite going into the year for the Walter Payton Award. I understand. Listen, no disrespect to Jason Shelley or Shador Sanders or anyone like that, but nobody is as dominant at their position as Xavier Gibson right now on the offensive side of the ball. And I think you've kind of seen recently, I think a lot of guys who are kind of fitting that edge position have really taken the I guess, favoritism for that award just as the schemes have developed. And I think Thompson kind of fits that role perfectly where if he goes and has an Isaiah Land year, James Houston year, where he can get 15, 20 sacks and, and rack up those tackles for loss, I don't see why B.J. Thompson couldn't be right there in that award. And, you know, I think it's tough for like a secondary guy because I think Miles Hurd has the talent. It's just – it's going to be tough. Like if Justin Ford didn't get it last year in the secondary – with the year he had, I just don't see how a second day. What else? What else did you possibly want from a cornerback or a defensive back that Justin Ford didn't give you? Then you didn't even let him be a, a finalist for it. That's exactly it. The Buchanan Award's going to be someone on the edge because of just because of tackles, because of uh, because of sacks. I mean, that's going to that's going to get it more than 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 a, someone secondary and. That's just what it is. It's you know, it's, it's a bias to that position as well, and, that, and that's fine. You know, I mean, that's that's just how it goes. 
it, it's a bias of sacks. I don't know if it's a position. I just think people overvalue sacks. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it's crazy because, I mean, looking at last year, I was like, when I did the preview, I remember I did the preview of the award, and I was like, Troy Anderson should run away with it. Like, there there's, might not even be a debate. I was like, Troy Anderson should receive all the first-place votes. And then – Isaiah Lane came out of nowhere, and I was like, "Okay, I don't think I don't think people watch the film on what Troy Anderson was really doing." I was like, "I get it, sacks are, sacks are valued, but man, Dustin, I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on the show, previewing some Stephen F. Also talking some FCS and everything at the end. But again, plug all your shows, plug social media, everything like that, man. Let people know where they can support you throughout the season." Yeah, well, once again, thanks for having me. So you can find me on Twitter, the Rev SFA. Um, I am known as the Rev. That's my nickname. It's a long story. Uh, but you can go, uh, like I said, we have the Wax Done Weekly with Will Siler and Brandon Owens, uh, UCA and Jacksonville State guy. We will, uh, you know, record Sunday nights, get them out Sunday nights, Monday morning. Uh, part of the SCS Fans Nation Network. So if you haven't gone to FCS Fans Nation, go ahead and like and subscribe, just like you would do here for the Blue Bloods. Like and subscribe, you know, and, and, and enjoy it because we've got Montana, we've got SDSU, we've got you know, Cocky Nation, Jacksonville State, we've got Eastern Washington, just every sort of piece you ever want we have. And then the big show that the, that Matt, uh, Jamie, and Kyler run on, on Sundays across all of SCS is definitely uh, worth watching. So like FCS Fans Nation page, you know, the Rev SFA on Twitter, and then Wax on Weekly, you know, we're always open for uh, any sort of content you have. If you have any questions or just want to debate stuff, we're all here for it. Absolutely. My guys over at FCS Fan Nation also just hit a thousand subs, man. So make sure to go subscribe. They're on the road to 2K right now, man. Big things in the works there. They just signed a bunch of new podcasts on the network and everything. So I'm telling you, we watch our stuff and also go watch FCS Fan Nation stuff. They have amazing, amazing content creators over there, guys. But for Dustin, for myself, for the Blue Bloods, also tune in this weekend. Jacksonville State, Stephen F. Austin in Montgomery FCS kickoff game going to be one you do not want to miss but for dustin myself and the blue bloods we are out for right now